So I think the story has to start with me. My therapist asked me a simple question. What is a healthy love? I didn't have the answer. He told me most people won't. And if they do, most will be different. I want to tell you I've never been afraid to be in love, but I'd be lying if I said that. I didn't realize where this fear resided until I watched the last season of a show I've become so fond of and a movie that told me a lot about myself. It made me realize maybe my heart is more afraid than I thought. Hey, I'm Cam Hayden, and today I want to talk to you about the fear of love. As always, this is a new channel, so like, comment, and subscribe because every bit helps. I want to introduce this by asking a simple question. What is love? To make things short and sweet, I want to narrow this down by one simple definition. Nietzsche's argued that love is the highest form of friendship. What makes most relationships fail is not the lack of love, but a lack of friendship. I don't know that we will ever know the meaning of life, but I do know that part of it has to be involved with love. Love is written about endlessly through time. Love is something many covet and many lament over for so much of their life. Love itself being all these things doesn't even have a true definition, and yet we often find ourselves chasing after it, me included. The thing I find many people don't speak about is the looming nature of fear when it coincides with love. In particular, being enough to receive a healthy love. I mean, how do you determine whether you deserve anything in this world when people will tell you often that the world owes you nothing? To give you any sort of definition of love past what Nietzsche's identified as love would be next to impossible. So, so for now, let's stick with the idea that love is a continued action for friendship, care, and patience. This leads me into the first bullet point, Otis and his fear. Now, to be honest, going forward holds a few spoilers about two pieces of media, Sex Education, a Netflix original series, and the Hot Cheetos movie. Listen to what I have to say before you make your judgments. I'll have you know I definitely cried, but before all that, let's talk about Otis, the main character of sexual education. I'm gonna be honest. I know this show is extremely compelling because I don't even like that I relate to Otis. Otis is a stubborn boy who chooses to try to fix everyone else's problems but his own. In most cases, he ignores his own problems until he no longer can. That's really how we arrive at this scene. Otis has been ignoring his largest personal flaw for a while now, or at least the root of this flaw, his relationship with love. There's something about seeing him realize that his intimacy issues stem from seeing the pain that love caused his mom, her days and nights in pain weeping, over a love she hoped would last. It is really easy to close yourself off from the world to prevent yourself from receiving such a tragedy. In our constant need to find love that works for us, we often find ourselves wounded. It's not so much we end up fearing love, but instead fearing the consequences of opening ourselves up to love. Intimacy, for starters, requires a deep level of understanding. My friend Byrie always states that love reveals the cracks, and as aggressive as that may seem, I can't help but agree with her. This reveal of the cracks we hold inside our foundations can be one of the most healing things if we let it. But Fearing love isn't just about fearing what it will do to you. It's also about what it will do to how you view you. Everyone is not always comfortable enough with themselves to want to be whittled down into understanding their core being. Hell, most of life is about determining and accepting who it is that you are and what it is that you want. But all of this leads me into the next topic hot cheetos and love i remember very vividly being in an unfulfilling long distance relationship with a girl that i really cared about it's just the relationship wasn't what either of us wanted 
in the last leg of our relationship, the thing that helped me leave wasn't talks from friends or terrible treatment. It was watching the Hot Cheetos movie. To be specific, it was one scene in particular. It's getting so bad your wife is looking for help behind your back. She's lost all faith in you. Hey, 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 hey! You do not speak for me, Bacho, and you sure as hell don't speak for God. Richard, look at me. I did not say that I didn't have faith in you. I know what Richard is, and I know what he isn't. Not educated, sure, but he is the smartest person that I know. He already knows God. You want to save someone? Save yourself. And then you come to him when you're the father that he needs. Come on, baby. Here in the height of so much loss and setback, the main character, Richard, is faced with a challenge we see come to a point where, by all accounts, it feels like his wife may very well leave him. Things are stressful, money is tight, and life is complicated at this point. She doesn't, though. Instead, she decides she's going to fight harder for him and the relationship that they have. She decided to go all in on his dream with him and do it as a family. Something about this moment destroyed me. Of course, I'd seen the trope countless times, but I don't know. I think seeing it while being in a relationship that felt really one-sided made it hurt a lot more. To see how it was verbally and visibly easy to be fought for while dating someone I couldn't convince to watch A Sun's Head with me. I realized it wasn't that I was afraid of love like Otis was afraid to simply try. I was afraid no one would ever fight for me as hard as I would for them. For about a year now, maybe more, I've been pretending to read a book titled How to Not Die Alone. I say pretending because I never get past the pages I last finished on. There's one piece I always find myself stumbling through, a section dedicated to choosing someone who fights well. Fighting well refers to communicating in a healthy and effective manner. Something about it makes me think of bids. Bids are acknowledgments of things you or your spouse may grasp interest in at a fleeting moment. Interactions such as, oh, look at that bird, it's so beautiful. Your reactions to your partner's bids are meant to indicate the longevity of your relationship. Responses like, oh, wow, yeah, that's a beautiful bird. Or ones like this elderly couple as his wife shows him her paintings are examples of positive bit interactions the alternative shows where the decline in a relationship will come from responses like or show us how much attentiveness is being given in a relationship i realize from both the movie and this book i'm stuck reading that we don't ask for much as people. We just don't always have the words for what it is that we want, which leads me to the next thought. We should all yearn more, even if it hurts. After crying about a movie that was never meant to make me cry and relating to a character I never expected to, I decided for a while I would just stop dating. I wasn't getting anywhere with it and wasn't growing like I thought I was wasn't until the last person I dated that I decided to let myself yearn again. I've realized it was harder to write this essay because I never fully acknowledged what being involved in that relationship did to me. For once, I was shown that a person existed with all the qualities I'd found myself wanting and ones I didn't even know I needed. Thinking about it now, I know it was hard to write about love in general because it all felt as though it ended as quickly as it started. I was genuinely very cautious of love. I'd moved past fear, but was definitely still watching my steps along the way. This last relationship, it, it taught me that being hurt was worth it if I was willing to take the lessons that came with it. I have such an amazing time being a loving person and 
one thing I realized is that by limiting that piece of me, I was limiting so many other branches of myself in the process. As I mentioned, fearing love isn't as simple as fearing the action, but what the action does to us as people. Love reveals the cracks, which means love shows you who you truly are if you let it. So I decided to let it, to learn from love and accept that everything won't always work out. But when the cracks show up, it gives you a moment in time to remedy those cracks. The scars will, of course, always be there. But knowing where you're scarred helps you to communicate where it's best to be careful with your heart. This next section, I'm not sure what to label it. I came into this understanding last night. In all of this, I have spent nothing but time talking about romantic love. Um, obviously, that is automatically where most brains will go whenever you mention fearing love. But I do think it is important for me to take the time to speak on fearing love that you would give to yourself. I spent a lot of my adolescence and a lot of just growing up, even until now, I spent a lot of my adolescence wanting to be something more, wanting to. The easiest explanation is to be famous, but that's not really the easiest explanation. I tried so many avenues that I found earnest love in. I really, really enjoyed every avenue I tried from acting to dancing to making YouTube videos to becoming an artist to putting poetry out publicly to just being a public speaker. And all of these things brought me to a conclusion that I think I allowed to remain dormant within my own mind. You see, growing up, I acknowledged a lot of things about the world, the evils of man and the evils of the government that we reside under and the evils of the world. I wasn't just really, it wasn't really the best thing for me as a kid to be the only kid saying, yeah, that's objectively bad. And we are bad as a country, or we are bad in these ways, or these things are negative. It made life a little hard. Everybody just assumed I enjoyed arguing, which, I mean, I love a good discussion, but arguing, unless you know how to argue properly, I don't really want to argue with you if I'm being totally honest. And in this acknowledgement, I never really became somebody who could ever idolize any sort of celebrity because every time I would get close to the point of idolizing a celebrity, I would then find myself in the notion of discovering that this person was not as good of a person as you would have believed that they were. Um, and yeah, that goes hand in hand with the saying that like when you meet your idols, they don't always tend to be the person you want them to be. As time went on, I watched as both the celebrities that I wanted to be like as a kid and the people in my life that I deemed as close and friends and loved ones all sort of be in their own way corrupted by the Ides of Fame. I don't know if I'll ever make a video about that, but it sounds like a great title. Regardless, I had been taken advantage of by friends by financially. I had been, I've seen so many, I've seen so many unfortunate sequence of events with different friends. I have experienced moments that feel like they could have been solved better if people weren't chasing after. Uh, fame and in all of it I think I continued from my adolescence until now to hold on to the concept that being famous feels as though it leads to becoming a bad person after last night I had the simple understanding that I both need to show myself enough love to lean into the things that I love 
the most and dedicate myself to the things that I love the most without this fear looming over me and move past the fear. I determined that fame doesn't necessarily make you a bad person. I think it is the people who go unchecked without fame or become less conscious of the world around them as they dive deeper into fame. I think that I never really gave myself a definition of a bad person. And it's very similar to a series of events that led me to understand that I also wasn't a bad son um, because I never really gave myself a definition of being a bad son. But I often remember a quote from a cartoon where somebody is vehemently trying to not be a bad person. And one of the characters consoles them and tells them simply, tells them simply, bad people don't worry about if they are bad. They only worry about the thing that they're after. I'm not sure how any of this relates. This is kind of just an offhand tangent, but I do think that all of these things are circulated around love. And in learning to love myself more, I am learning that there are other things that you can be afraid of inside of love, not just being afraid of romantic love, but being afraid of love inside of friendships, being afraid of love inside of whatever divinity that you follow, being afraid of love of the things that you are passionate about. And I think that I was, I think that subconsciously I was aware that these things that I hold on to, these things that I move forward towards so passionately, I love them. They make me feel loved. They are an act of self-love. And by stopping them, I always seem to find myself in sort of a depressive rut. But also, by stopping them, I kind of alleviate myself of the ability to stop having to do the things that I don't love. Like working at a job that I don't love because I don't love myself enough to dedicate the proper time to the things that I love. And maybe not intentionally. Maybe it is just a, like subconscious self-sabotage effort. In closing, I'm really not an expert on love. There are so many nuances and conflicting stances on what love is and how to approach it. If you ask me why I made this video, I really couldn't tell you. Something about it has just been itching away at my soul. For anyone who's searching like me for love or who is in a place like I once was fearing love, I hope that this helps you the most. The biggest piece of advice in it all is just to learn to be okay with learning and loving more of who you are and what makes you you. Thanks for watching. I will see you guys next week.